Thank you, Amri. Thank you very much. And uh, my dear friends, Ambassador David Schubert of Australia, Ambassador Rako Ford of Costa Rica, and also soon there will be uh, Ambassador Simon Manta of Namibia. Uh, my dear colleagues and uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all and welcome to the uh, forum uh, group discussions on mainstreaming illegal fishing as transnational organized crime. First of all, let me thanks to all friends of fisheries and also uh, interested uh, colleagues from Michel. Uh, also, of course, we have also to thank all the panelists from missions and from UNODC. And on this occasion, I would like also to welcome Pa Mas Ahmad Santosa. He is the head of the Indonesian uh, uh, Task Force on Illegals on Prevention and Combating and Eradication of Illegal Fishing in Indonesia. And also Mr. Gunnar Stolfitz of uh, Norway and uh, Jessica Bettles from WWF, who comes from Jakarta, from Oslo and Geneva respectively, for sharing their views in this morning's discussion, today actually discussion. Uh, as an Indonesia, I just like others uh, in these rooms, have always had a special patience on the occasions and its wildlife resources. I think you will be agree with me that uh, on how essential uh, they are to our economy, livelihoods, and way of life. Yet human actions has affected them, especially fish and other marine wildlife and marine biodiversity and marine ecosystem. In the past few decades, illegal fishing has depleted uh, the world's fish stock, costing between 10 billion US dollars to 23 billion US dollars annually. Even more worrisome is the fact that those numbers are on the rise. In Indonesia it's alone, it costs between 10, 12 to uh, 15 billion US dollars annually uh, of the state loss uh, on our resources. So indeed, illegal fishing has become a major problem, not only for the management of sustainable fisheries, but also the ecosystems and in turn to the society as a whole. Action has already been taken by the international community to curb this illegal fishing. At the national level, Indonesia has taken serious steps, implementing various compliant measures, including through administrative and law enforcement measures. At the multilateral level, the fish stock agreements in 1995 and the conclusions of the FAO Compliance and Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries were adopted to address this serious act. Those efforts, however, are still inadequate. There is an increasing awareness of international community to the seriousness of this issue. However, the current strategies and the actions to combat it remain insufficient. In many cases, illegal fishing is either not punished or receives sanctions that are too weak to have a deterrent effect. The large scale impacts of illegal fishing is now constitutes as a threat to the maritime security of a coastal state, as it is also linked to other transnational organized crimes, such as trafficking in person, smuggling of migrants, and even corruption. Clearly, illegal fishing should not be seen as fishery administrative and management issues, as pointed out by the Global Initiative Against Organized Crimes and the, and the Blackfish Study. In their study, they said that illegal fishing met the threshold of transnational organized crimes. Consequently, a new approach is needed. From Indonesia's perspective, illegal fishing needs to receive a proper attention by being put in the same basket as the other manifestations of transnational organized crimes. The magnitudes of the impact of illegal fishing to our food security compel us to take serious actions to combat it. Against this background, this focus group discussion is a vital opportunity for us to discuss and help address the extremely urgent development challenges of illegal fishing in a comprehensive manner. As no country can address this crime alone, panelists and participants are also able to use this meeting to share experiences and challenges to find a possible solution to help combat 
illegal fishing in effective and sustainable manner. Let me underline that this is not a negotiating forum. It is not intended to reach any binding agreements or outcome whatsoever. This meeting is intended purely as an opportunity for all of us to talk, exchange views and ideas on this important issue. So please feel free to do so. At the end of the sessions, if all agree, uh, there will be a kind of chair summary of the meeting which is not binding to all of us. To conclude, it is my fervent hope that these events will be able to provide momentum to produce a clear roadmap and concrete step to be taken toward the recognition of illegal fishing as a part of transnational organized crimes. So I wish you a productive meeting and fruitful the outcome of this uh, discussion today. And thank you very much for your coming. Thank you, Ambassador, for the uh, opening remarks. Now we'll start with the first session, but uh, we will have a short break for the uh, panelists to come up uh, uh, to the stage. Uh, I would like to invite, to invite uh, Mr. Mas Ahmad Santosa, uh, Mr. Kunar Stolzvik from Norway, and also uh, uh, Ms. Kaya Poston from Australia. Please. Good morning. Thank you for the uh, introduction, Mr. Chairperson, Excellency Ambassador, Excellency Ambassador Australia, Hispanic and Media speakers and participants. Uh, let me share our experiences and challenges in combating eye fishing and other related crimes. And I think it's good momentum for Indonesia now to be uh, front runners uh, with all of you in combating eye fishing in the global level regional level as well as in national level. As um, evident by the statement of our president, <coughs> Joe Bowie, uh, this is uh, the first day when he was officiated as the president of the Republic of Indonesia. So he said we had to strive to restore Indonesia as a maritime country, the oceans, the seas, the streets and the bays are our future. We have been turning our backs on them for far too long. Now is the time to restore all <coughs> until we achieve Yalas Fifa Jayamahe, call it. In our seas, we are triumphant. That's uh, October 20th, 2014. And the Minister of Marine Affairs and Fishery, Madame Susi Pujiastuti, said two weeks ago, before I left for Rome and Vienna, IUUF is a serious crime. It does not only violate fisheries law, but also involves other crimes, such as illicit drugs trafficking, human trafficking, or trafficking in person, smuggling, and even transmission of disease HIV. As an immediate action, I will issue regulation to protect the workers. The regulation will be issued on the Human Rights Day, International Human Rights Day, on the 10th of December 2015. It was stated October 15, 2015. So this is the government actions to prevent and to combat IU fishing since the government was officiated under leadership of President Jokowi and uh, Madam Susi Kujastuti. So we introduced moratorium policy for all exporting fishing vessels, the new license as well as the extension of the license. And it is followed by ban on transshipment and also ban on using sail net and trawls. It is not sustainable, it is unsustainable way to uh, catch the fishes in our seas and establish to prevent and combat IU fishing and the task force then to conduct what we call compliance <coughs> audit or due diligence audit of 1,132 exporting vessels registered 
1,132. But uh, in fact, uh, we could found more than 1,200. It's about 5,000, 6,000. Um, then uh, the minister and the government uh, introduced the policy to sink captured IU fishing vessels. During 2015, we have already sank the vessels, 103 vessels during 2015. And in the same time, we try to strengthen the enforcement practice, law enforcement, by enhancing the coordination with Navy, Marine Police, Coast Guard, Tax Administration Office, and Financial Intelligence Unit. And we try to apply corporate criminal liability as well. So not only physical perpetrators, but also functional perpetrators and imposing administrative sanctions based on the findings in the audit compiled. So I will share it to you, the detail one. And on the October 13th, the President Jokowi, that's two weeks ago, just issued the presidential regulation to establish presidential task force in combating IU fishing, uh, led by Madam Minister Susi Pujastuti. This is a high-level task force, and the task is to apply the forceful uh, actions against uh, IU uh, fishers. And based on the compliance audit, based on the analysis evaluation, we develop roadmap to improve governance of fishery businesses, to pursue what we call maritime power with, uh, which is based on sovereignty, sustainability, and prosperity, and good governance. So, this is registered export investment in Indonesia. Of 165 <laughs> consists of 1,479 fishing license and 126 river license. So, this is registered 2012-2014, but to uh, the date of November 4th, and we have a number of 1,132 100, 100, 1, ex foreign vessels. Ex foreign vessels is uh, built in outside Indonesia. So this is the detail. And based on analysis and evaluation of ex foreign vessels, so we audited 1,132 owned by 187 license holders, so not all are legal entities, companies, but some of them uh, individual license holders, and distributed in 33 ports in Indonesia. So you could see some of them are owned by uh, uh, joint investors, <coughs> and uh, the, the, what do you call it, the origin of country, uh, mostly from China, and Japan and yeah next and Philippines, uh, Taiwan and Thailand. This is the result of our compliance audit or analysis and evaluation. So 100% of export vessels in Indonesia violated applicable laws and regulations. So. Uh, Severe violations, 769 vessels. Average violation, 363 vessels. So we have criteria to categorize severe violation and average violation. And the implication, legal implication is also different. So based on our finding, the minister uh, already imposed administrative sanctions. Revocation, business license 15, 15 companies are revoked already, the business license. Fishing license, 245, and then river license, 31. And then also suspension and notification. Based on the analysis and evaluation, we come up with the roadmap to improve governance of fisheries business, starting from 
improvement of vessel registration system and strengthening capacity port state control this in relation to port state measures agreement uh, promoted by FAO then improvement of catch and trade reporting documentations improvement of fishery license governance based on the governance fish stocks and fish allocation improvement of surveillance system and then develop comprehensive and integrated enforcement and compliance policy on IUUF introducing multi-legal disciplinary approach or multi-door approach and we also develop human rights traceability and then it will be um, it will be issued by the minister December 10 in addition to food safety and IUF traceability and strengthening regional and international cooperation uh, bilateral multilateral and with UN related agencies as well uh, let me uh, let me explain it, my uh, thought about IUUF as a transnational organized crime I uh, don't need to explain it to you the criterion for TOC but we all know that uh, uh, UNDOC and Indonesia has already ratified UNDOC on January 12 to law number 5, 2009. And this is the IUU fishing modus operandi in Indonesia. <coughs> A forgery of vessel documents, double flagging and double registered, fishing without licenses and appropriate documents, illegal modification of vessels, using foreign captain and seamen, deactivation of vessel transmitter not only vessel monitoring system or VMS but also automatic identification system or AIS and then illegal transshipment at sea forgery of logbook record absence of health certificate and export declaration issued by custom office and uh, health certificate issued by Ministry of Marine and Fishery violation of fishing ground using prohibited fishing gears and not compliance non-compliance in owning partnering with the fish processing unit and we also found in the field fishery related crimes which often attached to uh, IUUF for example illegal transaction of fuel immigration related crime custom related crime money laundering tax crime corruption labor related crimes and illicit drugs trafficking this is the TOC or transnational organized crimes elements in IUF modus operandi double flagging and double registered using prohibited fishing gears illegal transshipment at sea if it relates to the UN trans, uh, United Nations Convention on transnational organized crime and TOC elements in fishery related crimes modus operandi as well yeah next this is the case we handle Haifa case and thanks to my colleague Gunnar Stolfik uh, to support Indonesia in, in working together to to handle this case and with Interpol as well so the IU fishing case in Indonesia the violation is catch and export hammer shark without any permit AIS and VMS were deactivated once Haifa, Haifa is the name of the national vessel entered Indonesia water so the length of Haifa is more than 100 meters sail back to China without seaworthiness and port clearances so this is the verdict of Indonesian court that we actually disagree with the result and result district and appellate court ruled the Haifa captain guilty and imposed fine only amounted to 200 million rupees around to 15,000 US dollars currently Haifa is under investigation by our marine police for different violations and this is another case uh, oh this is this is um, the example uh, we have a very close cooperation with our NCB Interpol in Indonesia as well as with the Interpol in Lyon and uh, other countries as well. So this is transnational element in Haifa. 
vessel is operated through a company registered in Indonesia. The Indonesian company is affiliated with a Chinese company registered in Cayman Island and listed in the U.S. stock market in Nasdaq. Haifa uses Panam Panamanian flag and exported Haberhead shark caught in Indonesian waters and Haifa captain is a Chinese citizen. And another case is Pusaka Benjina case. So I just want to uh, share to you the transnational elements in Benjina case. Victims of trafficking and slavery originated from various countries, Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. One of the owners is a company registered as British Virgin Island. It is affiliated with a Hong Kong company owned by two Thai citizens. Most fishing vessels were built in Thailand and using at least Indonesians, <coughs> Thai, and PNG flags. So not only double flagging, but triple flag. Caught fishes from Indonesia and tramp ship the fishes in the PNG waters with the Thai labor. So, uh, another policy uh, the government of Indonesia introduced is sink the vessels. It is legal under law number 45, 2009 on fisheries, and we also uh, refer to UNCLOS, yeah, ratified by our law 1785. So this is number of vessels sank by ministry and navy and police, so 103 during 2014 and 2015. So uh, I would like to share it to you how important we um, we have to change the paradigm in enforcing IUU fishing. So we call it as a multi-door approach in marine and fisheries. Uh, we are not only relying upon one law, one legislation, but various laws <coughs> and legislation, as you could see in my presentations. And why multi-door approach? Um, crimes in marine and fisheries sector is a cross-sector crime. Statutory limitation makes it necessary to use other regulation to capture IU fishing perpetrators. IU fishing usually involves money laundering, bribery <coughs> and gratification, and tax evasion and fraudulence. Why multi-door approach? So we need, by using multi-door approach, it requires broadening the perspective, multi-legal disciplinary, multi-law enforcers and institution, synergy among law enforcement officers, and we need to apply the principle of follow the suspect and follow the assets. And this is our challenges and ways forward. So we try to one by one to what we call it, subside the, the hurdles. So the challenges, limited access to, ferry, to verify the originality of vessel registration documents, particularly or vessel built in foreign countries. And limited access to information sources which lead to foreign owners, buyers, and or private employment agencies. Lack of support and coordination from other countries and international organization to address transnational IU fishing cases that may involve more than one national jurisdiction. But now it's getting better when we try to develop multilateral as well as bilateral cooperation, and thank you for uh, Ambassador Rafa Budiman as well to hold this conference. Gap of perception among law enforcement in Indonesia in handling IUUF cases. Lenience in punishment and corporate criminal liability is seldom applied in IUUF cases. So we try to uh, offer the solution as well uh, on the right side. So this is last, uh, my last comment. Indonesia's effort to combat IU fishing and fisheries related crimes. So, defining IUF as a TOC is, is our, it's our homework, actually. Uh, because by defining IUF as transnational organized crimes, it requires we need to have harmonization of national legislation with TOC principles. It eases exchange of information including analysis of information that we need, especially for taking legal action. It eases law enforcement cooperation. It eases transfer of criminal proceedings. 
It eases international cooperation for purpose of confiscation. It eases extradition and mutual legal assistance. Second, in addition to define a U.S. POC, to apply multi-door enforcement approach. And third one is strengthening coordination and synergy in prevention and eradication of IUUF in national, regional, and international levels. And last point is improving fisheries business governance to pursue sustainable fisheries ma management as I already mentioned it to, to you, consists of eight issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Masandosa, for the comprehensive uh, presentations. Next, uh, we will have Mr. Gunnar Storvix. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, to, to invite me to uh, Norway to participate in this, uh, this workshop. <coughs> I think it's, uh, it's also very important to remember that uh, I believe that this is the first um, fisheries crime uh, meeting in Vienna, uh, as far as I can uh, recall. And I think it's, it's very important and uh, uh, previously there have been uh, a lot of work through the, uh, the CCPCJ and in other forums and also we had the expert meeting on crime at sea, TOC at sea, which also touched upon these issues. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, very good that uh, Indonesia took this initiative to, to start a dialogue uh, between countries on how to proceed on this issue. So my approach to, to this issue is uh, based on uh, Norwegian policy um, and how we look at this problem. So uh, please, the next slide. First, uh, very shortly, how we organize this work uh, in Norway. We also, the same way as Indonesia, we look at this from a multi-door approach. We believe that that is important. It is, um, it's interagency cooperation is, is essential when dealing with uh, complex issues and uh, of a transnational character. Now, I'm the, the head of, uh, of a network of different law enforcement agencies in Norway, um, which includes the, the Fisheries Directorate, the Police, Taxation Department, Labor Inspection Authority, Coast Guard Customs Department and the Coastal Administration. And um, I'm the head of the Secretariat and I report the activities to uh, the board in, uh, between the different ministries that are responsible for the different law enforcement agencies. Um, please um, have a look at these agencies because the police is part of this and that is extremely important. Now the system that we have in Norway is, is perhaps a bit different from other countries. In Norway we have what we call compliance agencies that do control activities. Uh, for example the Directorate of Fisheries and the Taxation Department, they do not have police authority. They do. Um, uh, they inspect um, the books of of, uh, of companies, the taxation department. The same with the customs uh, department. Uh, the directorate of uh, fisheries. They uh, they see whether the, the fishermen and the ship owners have are in compliance with Norwegian regulations. But in the Norwegian legislation that governs all these different areas, also have a chapter on, on uh, uh, crime. And that chapter is not the responsibilities of these agencies. The responsibility is in the police. So what actually happens is that if the Directorate of Fisheries, during a compliance control activity, detect or get a suspicion of, of a crime, then it is being reported to the police and then the case is under the Prosecutor General of Norway that then is the one in charge of investigating it uh, as a criminal case. And I think it is important to understand because this is the basis on how we believe that we should deal with the issue of IUU fishing and fisheries crime. We distinguish between those two concepts. 
So please, the next uh, slide. Now, the way we look at it, um, now this is actually a, a definition that was in uh, the UNODC um, report on transnational organized crime committed at sea. We, we look at it as a criminal conduct that may impact negatively on the marine living environment. So all criminal activity that contributes to, um, to an overfishing and that makes it difficult for us to manage the, the resources that we have at sea is, uh, is part of what we call a fisheries crime. That includes uh, corruption, uh, it includes um, tax fraud, human trafficking issues and so on. All of these issues are part of the business model on how you are going to, how are you going to, to organize this illegal activity. Well then you have to, to, to organize yourself through the whole value chain from you actually fit the fishes caught and somebody eats it somewhere. Because you want to earn money on this and you want to be able to spend the money and, that it, and then you have to launder the money. <coughs> so, fish is basically money swimming around in the ocean. Nothing else. They don't fish because they love fishing, it's because they love money. And that's the way it is with all kind of business. Whether it's legal or illegal. So it's money. It's all about money. And that's why we believe that we have to look, look at this from a, a criminal perspective. Because it generates huge amounts of money. Um, and the next, next slide, please. And before we move on to, to these organizations in Norway, for example, we, uh, we lost uh, in, uh, in the beginning of the, of the 2000, from 2000 until 2008, approximately, we lost every year almost 200 million US dollars to uh, that uh, uh, because of, of illegal fishing in the Barents Sea. And that is a lot of money. And uh, that is what we see around the world, particularly with developing countries, that they are losing a lot of their natural resources. It is being stolen. So how are we going to respond to that? Um, in my presentation, I think it's, uh, it's important. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the problem per se, I think that everybody understands that this is a huge global problem. What I would like to, to talk about is, is what kind of organizations should be involved in this work. So the main organization that I'm going to talk about today is about Interpol, UNODC, ILO and OECD. Uh, the main organizations uh, we believe is UNODC and Interpol. Next slide please. But, of course, we have the issue of IEU fishing and the FAO. So, why do we not include the FAO in this, um, in this uh, approach? Well, it is because the FAO do not have a crime mandate. Now, this is from the constitution of, uh, of the FAO. But their role is to secure that there is food in this world. And uh, they don't have a mandate to, to work on organized crime, transnational organized crime. In our view, and I believe that's, uh, that's uh, uh, quite obvious, is that um, uh, the organization, the mandate to, to, to uh, on a normative level, to work against transnational organized crime is UNODC. The next slide, please. Yes, so in our view, it's you know to see that this mandate to assist member states in the struggle against crime, uh, and of course these others, I, I've taken that from your website. <laughs> but, uh, but in this issue, it's particularly crime that is the, is the main issue. Next slide, please. Um, in Norway, we criminalized illegal catching of fish back in the 1930s. In 1930, you could go to prison for five months. Uh, today, uh, you can go to prison for six years. And that is for transnational organized fisheries crime. So, it is only the, the most serious violations that where you will actually get punished for six years imprisonment. We actually raised uh, the, the 
penalty from three years to six years imprisonment two years ago. And that was um, because we wanted to implement the UNTOC Convention in the Norwegian legislation. So we have actually implemented the UNTOC Convention into the Norwegian um, uh, fisheries legislation. Now, this is to explain uh, how we look at this. We look at this as a two-track system. We have uh, the issue of fisheries crime that uh, is, is all about whether it's criminalized or not. But, as uh, Mr. Santosa just explained, uh, it is much more than just the illegal catching of the fish. It is a lot of crimes that is associated or are intimately uh, part of these operations. So when we're dealing with the issue of fisheries crime, we don't only look at whether you have criminalized uh, the illegal catching of the fish, but it could also be the issue of uh, um, document fraud, corruption, etc. That is something that is already criminalized in most countries uh, in, in, the, in the, the General Penal Act. Um, I'm also the chair of the Fisheries Crime Working Group at Interpol, so I have um, uh, insight in, in several operations that's been done on this issue um, through Interpol. And one of the observations is that for co even countries that do not have criminalized illegal catching of fish, they can still uh, participate in, uh, in transnational operations. Because usually it is not the, the illegal catching of the fish that is the main crime. What we have seen in several cases is particularly the issue of fraud. It is how they fraudulently obtain nationality of different countries. It is how they do the forgery of, of official documents. In many cases we've seen uh, official stamps that have been, uh, been um, uh, created by themselves um, and they have used that to, to, to do forgery of, of, uh, of uh, registration documents and so on. Uh, we also see corruption because um, the fish has to be, be landed somewhere and also being brought into the legal economy. Uh, we see um, um, also money laundering issues human trafficking issues, labor exploitation, and we've seen that in many cases. It is not as uncommon that we might think. I think that this is an area where there is a lot to do, and it's something that has been involved through many, many years, but we haven't looked at it properly. Unfortunately, on uh, some of these uh, illegal fishing vessels, there is a high degree of labor exploitation, and in some cases human trafficking. So, but all of this is already criminalized in all of our countries. So that is what we have to focus on. We have to focus on what do we have in common in these cases and not focus on what we are lacking. So my advice is that instead of creating new um, legal instruments, international legal instruments, or to create new legislation, let's first have a look at what do we already have. What kind of opportunities do we have in the, in the mainstream panel code? What is applicable in these cases? So that is, is basically what uh, our approach when it comes to, to fisheries crime. We look at this as a two-track system. Now, UNODC is the UN agency that have a mandate on transnational organized crime. Interpol is not a normative organization. It is an organization that helps countries to connect to each other. And ILO also have a limited mandate on the issues on forced labor. This organization is what we call the fisheries crime track. And that has to be distinguished from what we call the IEU fishing track. Now, IEU fishing is, is a little complicated, but I'm trying to, I will try to explain it, but I will explain it from a crime perspective, because that's why we are here. 
Um, I U the first I is about illegal, the sec and the second letter U is about um, illegal, unreported, unre is about unreported fishing, and the last one is um, unregulated, unregulated fishing. So uh, you see, <laughs> it's it's a bit uh, difficult. Anyway, what what is problematic to use that term in a crime context? is particularly the issue of unregulated. What is that? If a country decides not to regulate your fish stocks, is it then a crime? If you say yes, then I'm asking how is the police in my country going to operationalize this? If one of our neighboring countries, and I, I think I'm going to use Sweden as an example, because usually we don't have any or also about the fish stocks with Sweden. But if, if, for example, Sweden decides that, well, this year, we, we will have, our fishermen can fish as much as they want. And uh, this could have a devastating effect on, on the fish stocks in the area, but we don't care. Is that a crime or is it a bad political decision? In our view, it's a bad political decision. You can't criminalize acts of a government. That is impossible. So, and that is the problem with the term IEU. Because IEU fishing is a fisheries management tool. It is a tool that has been developed through the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, to, to have a proper management of our fish stocks. So that term includes a lot of different issues issues that is very politically sensitive uh, because uh, in the case of Sweden the reaction from Norway could be that we maybe blacklist their fish on our market but that would be a political decision because it's, it's almost like a sanction of that country because they have I such poor we will not support uh, that issues. but it's not a crime if the Swedish fishermen are fishing and it's not a crime in Sweden, then it cannot be a crime in Norway either. So, so that is, is why we believe that it is important to distinguish between fisheries crime track and the IEU fishing track. If we use the same term for everything, then we believe it will be very difficult to, to come to a consensus. And also we fear that the mandate of the FA will be very challenged. So, in respect of, of the two UN agencies that is going to deal with these issues, we think that it is important to have a distinction. Even if there is a small overlap, we believe that it is important to be able to distinguish between the core of, uh, of those two terms, which also means the core of the mandate of those two UN agencies. And then of course in the IEU fishing track we also have what we call the RFMOs and that is Regional Fisheries Management Organizations. In a way that is, um, is more opera operational uh, regional organizations that is focusing on, on particular areas of the world and how to manage the fish stocks and some of these organizations also have enforcement schemes but that is based on, on an administrative uh, issue. It is not based on, on criminal uh, investigation or, uh, or any type of, of criminal um, issues. So, in our view, this is, um, uh, this is a two-track system. That doesn't mean that it is two competing systems. Um, although sometimes it can give an impression of that. We also believe that we need a sort of coherence between the two tracks because we have seen in actual cases uh, through Interpol that sometimes um, it is, uh, there are conflicting methodology. Now, the fisheries crime track relies on, on the way that you deal with any type of transnational crime, which is mutual legal assistance, 
it is to ask countries to secure evidence on behalf of other countries, extradition, all these issues that we know from any other type of crime. And that is the point. It is a crime. It is criminalized in many countries and therefore we have to deal with it the same way as we would with any other type of crime. The challenge is that in the IEU track you have something that is, is, is based on a lot of the enforcement efforts in that track is based on not letting vessels into port, uh, port state measures. Um, and that can be challenging, especially if the vessel that you're looking for, if there is suspicion of uh, human trafficking victims on board. Do you want to close the, the all ports all over the world for those vessels? Or do you actually want to rescue these people? Or do you want them to, to, to drift around that sea for years? You also need to get on board the vessel to secure evidence. Not evidence necessarily for illegal fishing, but you also need evidence to, to, to understand where the proceeds go. How, what kind of companies is owning, who is the real owners, who is the beneficial owners, etc. Information like that. You also need information about about the identity of the people working on board, what kind of nationalities are there, etc. Et so, our point is that we need to have a more coherent policy to both of these tracks, but at the same time that we need a clear distinction between those two tracks. Now, one of the organizations that the Norway is a member of, which is the OECD, and of course this is, uh, we, we, um, we believe that OECD could be a tool to create a more coherent policy to those two tracks. We have already started that process, and uh, next year there is going to be um, uh, a workshop in, in, uh, in OECD on, uh, on IEU fishing and, and uh, fisheries crime. But that is about how you fit it together. It is, not, uh, it is just a forum for states to discuss these issues. And why we believe that OECD is important in that picture is because OECD countries are a very important part of this picture. Not necessarily as the victim of the global uh, fisheries crime, but as, as, um, as countries where we see that unfortunately many of the companies and also the people that benefit from this activity is actually residing. So that's why we believe that those in this country is extremely important to bring in and to, to engage with. But it's a two-track system and, um, and um, our focus now is the fisheries crime track. Uh, we also have a focus on IU fishing track, but that we leave to discussions with, uh, with uh, the FIO and RFMOs and so on. But the bottom line is that we have a fisheries crime track and we believe that it's already established. And uh, the question is, what do we fill that track with? Interpol is already working on these issues. And, um, and, um, and I believe that UNODC is now starting to, to work on these issues. Uh, UNODC had a meeting in the Seychelles um, a couple of weeks last week, and um, I believe that was, that was the first fisheries crime working uh, meeting. So, so this is gradually starting, but I, in my opinion, we must engage the UN level on this issue. We cannot discuss fisheries crime in the FAO. The only organization that we can discuss these issues is in UNODC. Interpol have worked now for at least three years on cases, but Interpol is not a normative organization. They do cases. They do operations. <clears throat> and with all respect, I, I, I work with Interpol all the time, but we need some issues have to be lifted up on a UN level because it is fisheries is very political also when we're dealing with it from a crime perspective and some issues have to be lifted 
And one of the one of the issues that I feel very strongly for is first of all that uh, UNODC have to get uh, the sufficient funding to, to be able to, to build up a fisheries crime expertise and also to assist member states to, um, to um, uh, on capacity building. And secondly, we also need a forum where member states can discuss these issues and not only discuss where the fisheries crime exists but actually how to develop it. How is this going to fit with our own legislation? How is this going to fit with the law of the sea, with human rights standards, etc.? And I believe that the already established um, expert meeting on transnational organized crime committed at sea is something that has to, to continue. Remember that the first um, expert meeting on TOC at sea, one of the, actually the first recommendation was to clearly, clearly demarcate between uh, transnational organized crime in the fishing industry and IUU fishing for the purpose of UNODC's mandate. And this is where we left. And we have to continue this discussion. So I'm hoping that there is um, um, an agreement that uh, expert meetings on organized crime committed at sea is an important part together with uh, enabling UNODC to take these, uh, these issues further and to develop a, a good fisheries crime program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, comprehensive uh, presentations on merging uh, experiences. Now we have uh, uh, Ms. Kaya Pulston, you have the floor. Thank you, Henri. Uh, thank you also to Ambassador Fudiman and to the, the Indonesian Permanent Mission for convening this meeting on a very important topic. It's something that a number of us talk about from time to time, so that having a forum where we have a little bit more time and an opportunity to speak is, is really important, so thank you very much. Um, looking at the experts on the panel here today, I think uh, I'm here more to bring a uh, slightly more diplomatic perspective, I guess. I, I'm not an expert on these issues. but. Um, from the beginning, I'd like to say that Australia takes a very strong stance on combating illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. Now, I use that consciously. Um, as my Norwegian colleague has pointed out, there are some um, debates around this, but we use this term at the moment because that is the framework that we have had. And we're pragmatic. We need to use what we can. We, this illegal fishing is something that we need to combat, and whatever we, tools we have at our disposal, that's what we use. That doesn't mean that there cannot be more developed or different approaches developed, but at the moment, that's the framework that we have. Today, I'd like to talk to you uh, about Australia's experiences in combating illegal fishing. Uh, in doing so, I'd like to touch on what we're doing domestically uh, and internationally, but with a focus on our regional efforts. I'll then identify some challenges that we've come across when we've been addressing uh, illegal fishing. In our experience, we have found that illegal fishing requires both effective domestic legislation, but also very effective regional coordination. Domestically, we have found that countries require legislation to implement effective fisheries management frameworks. This includes measures to implement responsible fishing practices, uh, to monitor control and surveillance measures, responsible port state and flag state measures, and appropriate enforcement provisions that can be enacted when illegal fishing is identified. Regional cooperation is also required to share surveillance information on suspected illegal fishing activity, to build capacity of all countries to take appropriate action, and to enable more effective monitoring of fishing activities, both along shared maritime borders and also on the high seas. So domestically, Australia's key domestic legislation is the Fisheries Management Act of 1991. Our domestic legislative framework is consistent with international measures and those measures that have been in place that we have been able to um, make our, our domestic measures consistent with are um, those such as the FAO voluntary guidelines on flag state performance and the FAO agreement on port state measures. Our domestic legislation enables us to enforce conservation and management measures, to take action against vessels found to be fishing illegally in Australian waters, 
to implement surveillance, monitoring and enforcement measures, and to implement our obligations under international agreements. In addition, our legislation prevents Australian vessels from undertaking illegal fishing, and it prevents international vessels from landing or for, from transshipping fish without prime ministerial approval. This means that we can limit the options available for um, IUU vessels to offload their illegally caught product into our markets. Uh, in the same way that I think Indonesia and, and Norway have described, we've also established an inter-ministry group um, that develops options to improve or increase the tools available to Australia and also where relevant to our international partners um, so that we can address illegal fishing. And in this way we can also, it provides us with a mechanism to address developments as they occur so that our um, domestic frameworks don't remain static. We also share data and surveillance information internationally to enable Australia but also other countries to implement port state measures and it, this also provides evidence that assists in formal investigations and prosecutions against IUU vessels. We've also found that bilateral relationships with neighbouring countries, including Indonesia, have also helped to reduce the occurrence of IUU fishing in Australian waters. <coughs> As I stated earlier, we've found that regional cooperation is key to combating illegal fishing. It's vital to detecting and prosecuting illegal fishing and also in preventing fishing vehicles from being able to land their catch. Because we found this regional approach so important, we encourage the membership of regional fisheries management organisations and also the implementation of key international fisheries ma management agreements. In this way, we think that we can develop a coordinated international approach to the management of fishery resources. So we, in our turn, are party to and also very active in five regional fisheries management organisations. And of course, in the Australian context, these are the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, the South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Organisation, and the Commission for the um, Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna. We're also a member of the South Indian Ocean Fisheries Agreement and the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Mineral Living Resources. So as you can see, a lot. And we do find that these are very effective. Uh, we, we were instrumental in the establishment of the Southern Oceans, um, uh, the Southern Indian Oceans Fishery Agreement and also the South Pacific Agreement. Um, and we're also trying to support as much as possible the work that's being done in the Commission on Antarctic Marine Living Resources. Australia and Indonesia have a particularly close relationship on combating illegal fishing. Uh, just this year, the Australian Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources and the Indonesian Minister for Maritime and Fisheries Affairs signed a joint communique between our two countries, reaffirming our commitment to work together to combat IUU fishing. We've found that the uh, outcomes of effective regional cooperation have been highlighted recently, and I'd like to share a couple of examples with you just to underline why we find this approach so important. As a result of regional data sharing and implementation of effective port state controls through the Regional Plan of Action to Combat IUU Fishing in Southeast Asia, almost all of the IUU fleet known to be operating in the Southern Ocean are now out of action. This is a really great result, and Australia cont will continue to work with our international counterparts to combat IUU fishing. In this regard, we'd like to highlight that Australian and Indonesian officials work very closely under the Plan of Action as joint providers of the Secretariat. Uh, 